I'm going to uh, to cover sort of some of the uh, sort of introductory aspects of this subject, and then I, uh, Mike and John, then I think we'll get into more of the day-to-day -day management implications of it. But I want to share this with you as a starting point of what heavier market weights and changes in the way we produce pigs, what the implications have been for our industry. And I found this data just a little while ago, and I really find it quite fascinating. That in 1975, the, an average sow produced uh, just under 1,600 pounds of pork. That's through her offspring. But by 2009, that was over 4,000 pounds. That is something I think our industry can be very, very proud of, because that's a, that's a massive increase in productivity. That has been the consequence of two changes in our industry. Uh, the first one is a 40% increase in litter size and a 12% increase in, in market weight up to 2009, and of course they've continued to increase beyond that. What does that mean in dollars and cents? Well, doing some nutritionist version of economics, which is always a little bit dangerous. Uh, in 2009, we produced about 23 billion pounds of pork from 5.8 million sows. Now, if we uh, had to go back to 1975 productivity levels, we would need 14 and a half million sows. Uh, so that would mean we'd have to feed and manage and house another 8.7 million sows. Um, and just the cost, and obviously this is a little out of date, we, we dream of that now. Uh, but that basically w represents $26 per pig sold. So, you know, looking at more long-term average feed costs, if we were operating at 1975 levels, then our break-even cost just for feeding the sow herd, let alone housing it, managing it, um, all the other costs, would be increased by $26 per pig sold. What do we mean by marketing heavier pigs? Um, you know when you get a, a picture off the internet, it, uh, you can always be quite impressed. Uh, that's supposed to be a 22, and he was supposed to have brought down a pig that big with a 22. Well, he's got more kahunas than I do, but obviously it's a Photoshop picture, okay? So, uh, but it, it looks good. But this looks even better to me. I just got back Saturday night from Italy. Uh, this time I was in southern Italy, in Sardinia. Uh, but two years ago, I was in uh, Parma region, uh, famous for their uh, prosciutto uh, ham, uh, which they're very proud of. Now, those are heavy hogs. And uh, to qualify for Parma production, pig has to weigh about 160 kilograms live weight at market. That's their minimum. So um, those are way beyond anything that we're, we're dreaming about in this country. So what have, what have things looked like in this country over the last 35 years or so? And we can see that uh, live weights, other than a decline in the mid-70s, have basically increased in a linear fashion. So it's not surprising then that uh, 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 dress weights have gone up, and I'll show that in a minute, but where does this put us in the U.S. compared to other countries? Some people would have the impression that we are heavier than other markets, and we're certainly heavier than markets like Australia and, and, uh, and a little bit heavier than Canada and heavier than France and Spain, which surprised me a little bit, but this is Feostat. Um, but we're still a little bit lighter, actually, than Brazil, Germany, and the Netherlands in terms of, of dressed weights. Um, so our dressed weights look like this and, again, have increased in a linear fashion. But what puzzles me when I looked at this data is the, uh, is the dressing percent because it increased in a linear, largely linear fashion up until about 2005, and then it flattened out. And if anything, eh, it probably flattened out. And I'd be curious if anybody has any explanations for why that has occurred. I think one possibility is that we are feeding higher fiber diets now, and we know that you get a lower dressing percent there, but. 2005, 2006, I think is a little early for that, to explain that. Um, our pigs uh, are getting leaner, and, um, and so typically leaner pigs will, uh, fatter pigs will dress higher than leaner pigs. So that might explain part of it, but I, I can't explain that. So if anybody's got any ideas or suggestions, I'd, uh, I'd welcome that. Um, I've asked some people in the packing sector and uh, I'm waiting for an answer from them. So what are some of the issues? 
related to going to heavier market weights. Well, obviously, there's the positive side of things that from a packer side and from the breeding herd side that we can reduce our unit costs of production. And that's uh, a big part of what's driving this. But there's other things involved as well. We need to keep in mind what has supported this and allowed us to do this. Obviously, a rapid improvement in genetics. Pains me as a nutritionist to put genetics above nutrition, but we do have to give credit where credit is due. And Paul's the chairman of the session, so it seemed appropriate to do that anyhow. And, uh, oops, sorry. And, uh, but there is the evolution of our feeding programs, phase feeding programs, and so on that allows us to go to higher weights at, uh, and keep the cost controlled as much as possible. Um, increasing growth rates, and by that I'm really referring to barn management. And so, you know, we used to be at 1.4 pounds a day, and then 1.5, and then 1.6, and then 1.8 pounds a day, and it just seemed that whenever uh, the folks in the barn managed to squeeze out some extra growth rate out of their pigs, uh, the industry responded by asking them to carry the pigs to a heavier weight uh, in that same amount of floor space that they had previously. Um, so we need to keep in mind that, that that has also allowed this to happen. Um, and then there are certain feed additives, uh, paline and others, that have allowed us to achieve these increased weights with, uh, with limited floor uh, grow out capacity. But there is the, the marginal cost of this additional weight. And feed is uppermost in our mind, obviously, and I'm going to be talking about feed conversion and, and energy intake and so on in a minute. In a minute. But there's also the issue of feed, feeder space and floor space. And we know that as in our current production systems, as our pigs approach market weight, we are putting more and more pressure on floor space in the pen, and we're putting more and more pressure on feeder capacity. We just finished a a study on feeder capacity on a commercial farm, and, uh, and not surprisingly, as we expected, uh, we did start to see a tail off in performance when the pigs approached market weight, okay? Because we're putting, as the pigs get bigger, we're putting more pressure on feeder space. And then, of course, there's trucking capacity, so these are going to be talked about in subsequent talks, so I won't say any more about that. There's also the question of acceptance in the market, uh, in the marketplace and consumer acceptance of larger cuts. Um, and so to me, it, it, it speaks to the fabrication of new products or a refab fabrication of existing pork products in a way that still meets the needs of, of the modern consumer. And, um, and so, and I think we have to be very careful about this because the data on per capita pork consumption in this country is not, uh, it's not going in the direction we'd like it to, to go, and so I think we do have to be very, very careful that changes we make in our production systems are conducive to, um, to maximizing uh, consumer acceptance of our product. And finally, there's the understanding of the biology of the pig as we move forward, uh, looking at changes in body composition, in growth rate, and in, in feed efficiency so that we can anticipate the changes and, and do a, a determination of what our, our optimums are. So let's take a look at some of the data that's available on body composition uh, from Landgraf et al. Um, and this is, this is fairly typical. So it was a really nicely done study uh, and it shows that as a percentage of the empty body, um, ash doesn't change very much. Uh, it also shows that protein increases and then decreases, and I'll show that in, in a little better so you can see that a little bit more clearly in a subsequent slide. But the point I'd like to make there is if you look at that in broad brush strokes, the percentage of protein in the carcass does not change that much. What really changes is the proportion of water in the carcass, and water is about the cheapest thing we have to sell. Right? So as we move to heavier carcasses and an increasing proportion of fat in that carcass, um, then uh, we know that we're, we're, going to have, we're going to be suffering in terms of, of efficiency. Just as an aside, talking about biology of the pig, if we look at the fundamental efficiency with which the pig uses dietary energy to deposit fat, versus deposit protein, the greater efficiency from an energy point of view is depositing fat. Okay, on a caloric basis, 
the pig deposits fat more efficiently than protein. And so one of the questions that I'll ask my students is, well, you were taught as undergrads that the fatter pig is less efficient to produce than the leaner pig. So how can it be that a fatter pig is less efficient, but yet the efficiency of fat deposition is greater than protein deposition? And of course the answer is the green part, because when the pig is depositing protein, it's also depositing water associated with that protein called lean. And the efficiency with then with which the pig uses energy to deposit lean is much higher than the efficiency with which it deposits fat. It's the difference between protein and lean. We need to keep in mind is this water issue and we can see that there's less and less water in the carcass as we go to heavier weights. So let's take a look at this data a little bit more uh, um, carefully and taking a look first at protein in a 45 pound pig about 16 percent of the empty body will be protein and that rises to around 17 percent uh, between around 70 and 150 pounds and then it declines down back to about 16 percent at 325 pounds. My experience and we've ground up a lot of pigs and measured body composition that is a very good pig at 325 pounds. In fact that's a really good pig at 275 pounds because we would uh, grind up carcasses and find in the empty body um, as low as 13 or 14 percent protein. So the, the pigs that Landgraf is using in this study are not um, poor quality pigs. These, these, are, these are good quality pigs. So let's take a look then at fat now. And we can see that obviously the fat starts at 7 percent and then increases up to about 30 percent at 325 pounds. A couple things that are interesting and I'd like to point out one thing for you to keep in your mind as I go to a later slide is that protein and fat cross, i.e. it's a one-to-one -one relationship at around 140 pounds for these pigs. Okay, just keep that in mind. So beyond 140 pounds, the pig is now depositing more, uh, there's more fat in the, in the carcass than there is protein. And as we saw before, water declines from about 74 percent at 45 pounds, is at about 60 percent around 275 pounds, and drops to 53 percent. And just as an aside, whenever you're looking at numbers like this um, in carcass, but in actual fact in, in, uh, in feeds and grains and so on, uh, please keep in mind that measuring moisture is one of the most difficult components of the carcass or of grain to analyze. And the, the reason for that is, is that your sample is constantly equilibrating with the environment around it. And so you have to be very, very careful that when you're analyzing the sample that you are taking into account that change in moisture content. So we see some, we don't see a perfect, uh, perfectly smooth line here and that might be one of the explanations for that. It, it's amazing because measuring moisture is so simple you just put the sample in an oven at 105 degrees for a few hours and pull it out and reweigh it and it seems like such a simple procedure but the reality is to get an accurate measurement is surprisingly difficult. So let's move to a different uh, genetics because obviously the data that I show here will be very much dependent on genetic lines and here you can notice again that this is this is in actual weight so this is not percentage this is in actual weight and so we see that ash basically as a percentage will be staying the same so that was constant protein increases and was getting up to uh, um, uh, about uh, 40 pounds in this uh, in this empty body at 330 I'm sorry that should be 335 pounds not kilograms but look at the lipid here. The lipid has taken off above the protein 
well below the 140 pounds that we saw with the previous study in different genetics. Okay, and so here, uh, lipid exceeded the protein down around 100 pounds rather than 140 pounds. So that tells us, number one, that there are certainly genetic impacts on body composition, but it also tells us that how we feed this pig and how we fed, would feed Landgraf's pigs should be very different because the proportion of fat and lean in the body is different, so intuitively we should be feeding them differently. Now, I'd like to, to the last bit of data that I'm going to show is, is uh, shared with me from, um, by Casey Neal at PIC, a study that they uh, uh, did with Canberra 29 gilts. They fed two different energy levels of energy, a 1.5 megacals per pound and a 1.3. You might more normally be used to seeing 1,500 kilocalories per pound and 1,300 kilocalories per pound. And that's just when you hear me speak, unfortunately, uh, I bring my foibles to the, uh, to the microphone. And one of my foibles is, is that we can't differentiate between 1,520 and 1,525. So there's no point in even trying to present it. So it's either 15, you know, 1.52 or 1.53, I think, more accurately reflects to us what the accuracy of the energy measurements. So 1.5 versus 1.3, so that's a pretty low energy diet. Um, and looking at the weight, there was a small differential at uh, 29 weeks of age. So just as we move forward, keep in mind these pigs reached 275 pounds at about 25 weeks. And all the data will be presented on a week in the, in the uh, horizontal axis, so keep that in mind. So taking a look then at energy intake, thought this would be more interesting than just uh, feed intake. We can see that it rises, but it increases at a decreasing rate. Right? So if we look at 25 weeks, it's already starting to, you know, it's starting to decrease, the, the rate of increase decreases right around 21 weeks, 20 weeks, um, but this is a curve. And obviously we can see that these pigs were not able to increase their intake adequately to uh, compensate for the lower energy levels so their energy intake was low. And that's also a difference that you will see from genotype to genotype and certainly based on environment. If we look at average daily gain, we can see that it increases and reaches a, a, a maximum between about 180 and 235 pounds, and then declines. And the rate of decline, interestingly, was the same independent of the energy concentration of the diet. So the rate of decline was the same. They were just at different levels of average daily, of average daily gain. So it rises, it plateaus at 180 to 235 pounds, and then drops. So if we take a look at feed conversion, it increases or gets worse pretty much in a linear fashion. It does not tail up. There's, there's no, nothing in that data that would say that feed conversion gets increasingly worse as the pig gets to heavier weights, at least up to uh, uh, 335 pounds. It just is pretty much a linear uh, decline in the efficiency of feed utilization. The final uh, data that I'll show you is a study, um, actually, um, uh, well, let's just say we, we, we took some pigs to a heavier weight. These are 300, the boars got to 335 pounds. We started the study at about 87 pounds, and this was comparing boars, gilts, barrows, and vaccinated boars, and uh, because of the increased growth rate, the boars were doing 2.6 pounds a day. They got up to 335 pounds, where the barrels, for example, uh, only got up to 313 pounds. This was a study that we ran to a constant time rather than to a constant weight. And I typically run trials to a constant end weight. So we can see incredible feed efficiency. And actually, even from 86 to 306 pounds, 313 pounds, 2.6, 2.8 feet conversion, still uh, pretty darn good, tells us something about the quality of our, of our modern pig. 
So then to summarize my conclusions then is that the trend to, uh, to heavier market weights is encouraged by reducing costs, both at the producer side and the packer side, and it's possible due to improvements in genetics, nutrition, and management. Um, but it will also influence many aspects of management that will be talked about uh, in the rest of this session. While live and dressed weights have increased more or less linearly since 1978, dressing percentage has flattened over the last five years. Um, as weight increases, the percentage of protein changes in a relatively small uh, manner, but fat and water change substantially and in different directions, obviously. Actual changes will depend on individual genotypes. As weight increases, the rate of gain declines after reaching a peak between 180 and 240 pounds. Also, that will be genotype specific. Energy intake increases, but at a declining rate, and feed conversion rises or gets worse in an essentially linear manner. And current, now, and I say in an essentially linear manner, and that assumes there's no other constraints on those pigs, such as space, feeder access, water access, and so on. Current market conditions of high feed costs and low market prices, I think it's going to put pressure on market weights, and, um, but obviously those conditions will change over time and, and it's reasonable to expect that the trend towards heavier market weight will, uh, will probably continue.